Welcome, everyone. I have to say it is a total pleasure and honor for me to say just a couple of words about Satish Kumar. You probably have read the announcement that Arun sent around uh, that included the amazing story of his journey on foot from India to the then major set of nuclear powers to speak on behalf of peace and how he was encouraged in this venture by Vinoba Bhave, the, the father of the Bhudan movement. But I just want to say a, a little bit about his impact on the interface world between ecology, the study of nature, and a spiritual perspective or foundation. That, that is a significant portion of the environmental movement. And Satish was principal founder of an institution in England called Schumacher College, which has been a trailblazer in this entire area. It was founded in 1990. Uh, Walt and I uh, were able to take a course there in 1995. And Schumacher has worked in two ways. It, it offers some degrees, uh, but it has a worldwide reach because of the kinds of short-term courses that it offers. So it, it literally draws students from around the world for say one to three weeks. And the people who have taught there are the absolute stars of, of this whole movement. So the very first such lecturer was James Lovelock. Some of you may be familiar with the Gaia hypothesis, the, the, the understanding that in many ways, the whole planet that we live on works like an integrated living system, including its non-living components. It all works together. And he, James Lovelock, was the first teacher in this entire many, many years long series of courses that have promoted that kind of very deep understanding of the world that we live in. So I think it's absolutely fair to say that Satish and his work at Schumacher and also a magazine called Resurgence has had a global influence on many people who have taken on working on behalf of, in conjunction with, in union with the natural world as their principal dharmic direction of their lives. So he is somebody truly special. And I, I'm just thrilled that he's with us and that we have some time to spend with him. Satish. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much for this very warm and kind and very generous introduction. Uh, it is my pleasure too, uh, to be part of uh, this uh, group uh, and uh, accept your invitation to speak today about Hindu ecology. Very coincidentally and wonderfully, you mentioned James Lovelock and Gaia theory. Now, very interestingly, Hindu ecology is Gaia ecology because our, one of the, our greatest mantra is Gaia tree mantra. And Gaia tree mantra, Sanskrit word, and Gaia, the Greek word, are the same. Now, in Greek mythology, the Gaia is the living earth and the earth goddess. In Hindu mythology, from the Vedas, Gayatri Mantra comes from the Vedas, Gaia is not only the earth goddess, but Gaia tree. Tree is the goddess, and the Gaia is the whole cosmos. And it begins with Om, which means totality, the whole. The word Om means complete, nothing outside. Everything is included, like uh, omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscience. The same word Om is in Latin as well. Because there is a connection between Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit. So Om means the whole. Then within that whole, 
the mantra goes bhur bhuva swah savitur all these words come into the mantra so bhu is the whole universe bhuva is the earth swah is the sky or the uh, the heavens and uh, and savitur tat savitur tat is all uh, that savitur is the the sun and so according to hindu ecology the whole cosmos including the universe and there are many many universes but including this universe and this um cosmology that we have now and and our planet earth and the sky and the sun everything is a living organism so it's a very beautiful coincidence that james lovelock took the word from greek word gaia goddess of the earth and hindus have the same word gaia so and also um, the the gayatri mantra uh, considers everything is living the sun is living the cosmos is a living reality the the earth is a living reality and so we have considered in hindu ecology earth not only a living organism but sacred organism divine organism and so we worship mountains i went on a pilgrimage to mount kailash in the himalayas and i walked from nepal to tibet um for one week and then we i went around walking mount kailash for four days circumambulation what we call in sanskrit parikrama which means circumambulation and then i walked back to nepal and so we worship and go for pilgrimage to mount kailash so for us mountains are alive they are living in the same way um water is sacred and uh, the ganges river comes from the hair of lord shiva so we worship ganges so if you go to rishikesh um every evening there is a worship of the river and hundreds of people gather every evening with chanting of mantras offering the flowers offering the the candles light and so and every hindu it can say every hindu considers going to make a pilgrimage to rishikesh or haridwar or prayag where the three rivers meet the triveni sangam which is the ganga yamuna and saraswati the three great sacred rivers meet and we go there and take a dip as a, a purifier and so uh, water is sacred mountains are sacred uh fire is sacred so vedas have hymns and 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 mantras of the praise uh, and and the and the glory of earth air fire water so hindu ecology would consider that nature and humans are not separate the western science before james lovelock now we are changing the new science is creating a new story but the old science had an old story and the old story was that humans are separate from nature earth is a dead rock and inanimate and uh, and uh, forests have no soul water has no soul mountains have no soul animals have no soul and in the western um, old western thinking even humans who were slaves had no soul even even women had no soul so the 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 western people have come a long way which is a good thing uh, but still a long way to go they still think majority of the scientific thinking is still old story and that old story is that earth is a dead rock it's not alive and and has no intelligence has no memory has no consciousness where as a hindu ecology would say that everything is alive earth is alive water is alive um and and the fire is alive and space is alive time is alive and consciousness everything has a consciousness 
And so this is, I think, fundamental difference between um, the modern materialistic science, where science would say that only thing what you can measure matters. What you cannot measure does not exist. So particularly the French uh, scientist and philosopher um, René Descartes and many other, and then Newtonian science, where uh, it's a mechanistic. So, so the science, the old science considered nature as a machine. Even human body is a machine. Where the Hindu ecology would say that uh, nature is not a machine. It's a living, sacred organism with consciousness, with intelligence. Of course, um, similar like Hindu ecology, there were poets in the, in the Western countries like William Blake. William Blake said that nature is imagination itself. So nature is not dead. Nature is alive. Without being alive, how can nature have the imagination. So nature is the imagination itself. That's a William Blake. Uh, Shakespeare also got it right. Um, Shakespeare, uh, like the Hindu ecology, also said um, books in running brooks, tongues in trees. So he said trees speak to us, tongues in trees. Trees speak to us. We have to listen to trees. We have to go to talk to trees. We have to speak with trees. And trees don't speak uh, English, but they speak tree English. Tree, tree language. And in the same way, he said, um, the, the, the running brooks, the uh, books are running books, running brooks, the running rivers are books. We have to learn to read the book of nature. We have to learn to read the book of rivers. So tongues in trees, um, uh, books in running brooks, and sermons in stones. So he said that you don't have to go to a church or a temple, uh, or, or a mosque, or a synagogue uh, to hear the religious sermon. The stones are our teachers. Stones have sermons to give us. So, uh, sermons of patience and endurance and resilience and so on. And so, and good in everything. So I think Shakespeare and William Blake and Hindu ecology have a kind of confluence, meeting point. So, um, so nature and humans one the unity of life. This is the kernel of Hindu ecology, unity of life. We have, I mean, even in Big Bang, we would say we have all come from the same single origin. We all have come from um, Big Bang. But Hindu ecology would say that Big Bang is Brahman. Brahman. And everything originates from Brahman. And the origina origination of the world and origin of the universe and source of the universe is not a historical fact, but it is a continuous process. So Hindu ecology of Brahma and then Shiva and the Vishnu, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, these three great uh, divine figures represent the origin of the universe, continuation of the universe and dissolution of the universe as a continuous process. So every day, Every moment, every second, every hour, we have creation happening. It's a dance of Shiva, like a, like a dance. It's a continuous dance, Tandav Nitya, we call it. And so, um, so Brahma is the origin and, and a single source of all living beings. And we are all part of that Brahma. And so, uh, so from, from that, we take the unity. And then Vishnu is the diversity. Vishnu continue, is the continuation. And so unity from Brahma and diversity from Vishnu. This is a beautiful uh, combination of the two sides. And so diversity we celebrated, at the, even in a scientific language, at the time of the uh, Big Bang, there was a nothing. Uh, there was only gas or a li little bit later water. And slowly, slowly, for millions and millions and billions of years, it took evolution to create this diversity of life, which we have today in millions and billions and forms, um, in, in uh, flowers and, and animals and birds and, and the trees and the rivers, everything or this diversity of life has emerged. But diversity of life has emerged from one single source, and that is the source of Brahman, 
So we are all Brahman because we have all come from the same source. We have, we contain within ourselves the sacred quality. So unity of life. Therefore, Hindu ecology would say, uh, how, what does it mean in practice? In practice, it means that we must have reverence for all living beings, respect for all living beings. So reverence for life, like uh, Albert Schweitzer also used the term reverence for life, is expressed in the principle of ahimsa, non-violence. So ahimsa paramo dharma. In Sanskrit, we say this: the supreme religion, paramo dharma, is a supreme religion, is ahimsa, non-violence, doing no harm to any living creatures because all living creatures represent the divine, the unity of life, the sacred life. So we have to have a reverence for all life and no harm to any living creature. So in our time, Mahatma Gandhi was the great Hindu ecologist and Vinoba Bhave, with whom I worked, uh, as the Johnny introduction said, he was a great uh, um, Hindu ecologist. And so they all talked about the principle of non-violence as the ecological principle. And so we have to be non-violent to ourselves. That's the beginning, because we are nature. Nature is not out there. The mountains and the trees and the rivers and the animals and the birds are, are uh, nature. And we humans are not nature. This, there is no such difference. We are nature. And therefore, we have to be non-violent to ourselves. So non-violence to ourselves, loving yourself, caring for yourself, looking after yourself is part of non-violence. And then non-violence extends to all other people. Uh, uh, um, your family, your countrymen, women, um, children, um, uh, foreigners, um, uh, any language you speak, any religion you follow, any political philosophy you follow, um, any uh, race, uh, any gender, whatever you are, there is no difference. Hindu ecology upholds the principle of the unity and the equality of life. All life has equal value. There is no hierarchy of values. It is not that if you are educated or if you are white, or if you are male or you are Indian or you are American, all that idea of superiority and hierarchy is out, uh, out of the door, out of the window uh, in Hindu ecology. So uh, equality of life and dignity of life. All life has equal dignity and equality. And so uh, non-violence to all other people and not only other people of whatever religion, whatever race, whatever color, whatever gender, whatever background, no matter. Non-violence must be practiced as an ecological principle. And then the, the third level, which goes beyond humans, is nature out there. So we have to be non-violent to animals, forests, mountains, rivers. So pollution from a Hindu ecology principle would be a sin against nature. Waste will be sin against nature. Because, because how can you pollute and waste this divine creation. This is, a, this is a divine gift to the world. This universe is a divine gift. The water is a gift. The soil is a gift. The forests are gift. Animals are gift. So all those wonderful gifts that we have from Brahman, from divine source, we cannot pollute, we cannot waste. So that is non-violence. So waste is violence. Pollution is violence. Um, uh, and uh, you uh, desiring, craving, uh, craving and grasping for more things than we need in our life. So this is the second principle of uh, Hindu ecology is sanyam, restraint. So without restraint, there is no freedom. Like a river flows only within the restraint and constraint of two banks. If the two banks have no uh, uh, um, maintenance of the, of the con uh, containment and restraint, uh, uh, then a river can become a flood and it can be damaging. 
So the freedom of flowing the river can happen only within the two banks. In the same way, human freedom is not unlimited. It has to be within the limits according to Hindu ecology. And that limit is called sanyam, means restraint. So if I need two or three shirts, that's fine. Five shirts, that's fine. But I don't need to have wardrobe full of shirts. Uh, I need one or two or three pairs of shoes. Okay, uh, one for the winter, one for the summer, um, etc. And uh, one in the house, one outdoor. Uh, you can have that. But then, more than that, if you possess too much, um, then uh, it is uh, it is you are taking something from nature which can be used for other people. So, as I talked about Vedas uh, and Gayatri mantra coming from the Vedas, then comes the Upanishads. And Upanishads follow the same uh, principle. And, and in Upanishads, like Isha Vashya Upanishad, it talks about restraint. It says, Isha Vashya Midam Sarvam Yatkincha Jagatyam Jagat Tena Tena Bhunjitha Magrida Kashyas Vidhanam. This is the supreme ecological mantra of the Isha Vashya Upanishad. Upanishad. So what he says, is the Isha Vashimidam Sarvam. Whatever you see out here in nature and in human life, in human society and, and in natural, society, natural world, is all sacred. It's all home of the divine. Home and abode, uh, abode of Brahman and, and a Vishnu and a Shiva. And therefore, Isha Vashya, Midam Idam Sarvam, everything. Whatever you see, whatever you don't see, whatever that is, is all sacred. That's Upanishad. And so you can take from the gifts of the universe whatever you need. Mahatma Gandhi said that there's enough in the world for everybody's need, but not enough for anybody's greed. At the moment, our society promotes greed. Our capitalism, our government, our industry, our Wall Street, um, the, the banks, uh, they all, and, and all the consumer um, culture, uh, all the markets, all the uh, shopping malls, uh, everything promotes greed and waste and, and consumption. So Hindu ecology would say that um, human life, the purpose of human life is not just production and consumption. The purpose of human life is finer and deeper uh, is the kind of uh, searching for the meaning of life and, and reconnecting with the divine source. That is the purpose of life. But our industrial system has transformed that purpose into production, consumption, profit, and money. So our purpose of life has become production, more and more production, and more and more consumption. So that goes creates the problem of climate change, global warming, pollution, waste, and all those other, other ecological problems. And so, um, so Sanyam Upanishad says that um, purpose of life and purpose of nature is not production. Production and consumption should be the means to an end. Production and consumption and money and profit are for the well-being of the planet for the well-being of nature, for the well-being of animals, for the well-being of humans. If production and consumption used for that purpose, then production and consumption becomes a means to an end. And the end is human well-being and planetary well-being. But at the moment, humans have become the means to make more production and consumption and more profit. And nature has become a resource for the economy. So we look at as humans also as a resource. We call it human resources. So humans have become a resource. So uh, we are, humans are used <laughs> to create more and more profit, more and more uh, economic growth, uh, more and more production, more and more consumption. So human beings have become the means to the end of production and consumption and capitalism. And nature has also become a means to make more production, more consumption, more profit, and more, um, more uh, money, uh, economic growth. So the, according to Hindu ecology, 
This is the confusion of means and ends. We have to come back to, uh, to the principle that humans and nature are not the means for economic growth and production consumption, but they are the, uh, they are the in a way, end. And the production consumption are the means for the well-being of planet and, and well-being of people. So this is the fundamental um, difference between the modern economy and Hindu economy. Also, of course, Hindu economy and Hindu ecology go together. Uh, we are, we, ecology and economy are not separate. Uh, they come from the same root in Greek language. Uh, ecos means home, our planetary household, ecos. Greek word ecos means planetary household. And according to the uh, wisdom of the uh, Greek philosophers, our home is not only where we sleep, where we have our kitchen, where we have our dining, where we have our living room, our garden, our bathroom. According to Greek philosophers, the entire planet is our home. And we have to look after the entire planet as we look after our own household. This is the great wisdom of, of the Greek, Greek philosophers who um, not only invented Gaia, but they invented ecology. And it, logo, logos, logi means logos. Logos means knowledge. So knowledge of the planetary household is ecology. How all the species can live in harmony with each other. How all the species, humans, animals, forest, air, water, because we are all interdependent. The interdependence is the kernel principle of the Hindu ecology. We are all interdependent, interconnected, interrelated, and therefore we need to uh, know how we live on this planet Earth in a harmonious way. That's the ecology, knowledge of the house, planetary household. And the economy, nomos, means management. Once you know your household, then you manage it well. How many resources are there? Like in your household, you say, uh, we have so much money and uh, we have so many people, how much we can spend on our food, how much we can spend on our rent, how, can, how much we can spend on our electricity, how much we can spend on our um, clothes. Uh, we make a little budget and we live within our means. That's a household economy. So economy, true economy is a very beautiful word. But we have corrupted the word economy and turned economy as if it was money nomi. But actually, what we, what governments and industry and business and Wall Street and all these people are talking about is not really economy. They are talking about money nomi. They are only talking about economic growth. There's no economic growth. There's only money management, money movement, money going all around the world um, in stocks and shares and so on. So Hindu ecology has to be complemented with Hindu economy. And the greatest uh, champion of Hindu economy was Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi said, live simply so that everybody can simply live. So I have written a book on that, um, the, on Hindu uh, ecology and Hindu economy. Uh, it's called Elegant Simplicity. It's published by New Society Publishers uh, in Canada and it's elegant simplicity. And so that is the uh, kind of um, uh, uh, Hindu economy, uh, which was championed by Mahatma Gandhi. And he said that according to Hindu principle, we need to also honor the work, the handicrafts. So we need to bring the head, the hearts and the hands together and making something with your hands like building a beautiful house, beautiful clothes, beautiful shoes, imagination, creativity, art, that should not be discarded in the name of progress, in the name of development, in the name of economic growth, in the name of profit. All those things we have, we have in our modern time, they go against the Hindu economy and Hindu ecology because we have previously said that doing anything with your hand is a dirty thing. If you are working on a land, if you are a land worker or a laborer or laborer in a field or laborer in anywhere, arts and crafts, people making clothes in Bangladesh 
or Vietnam or people making shoes in uh, Morocco or in any poor countries, we pay them very little. If you are working on the land, we think only if you are not educated, if you are not clever, you are not successful, then you work on the land. If you are successful, then you go and work in the Wall Street or you work with uh, big companies. So this is the kind of confusion which goes against the Hindu ecology and Hindu economy. So Mahatma Gandhi championed the idea of Swadeshi and, and handicrafts and local economy and say, we must respect the work and everybody who produces food, clothes, shoes, furniture, house, they should be respected. And so craftsmanship, artisan work and art and craft became the, the uh, motto of Mahatma Gandhi's uh, Hindu economy. So Hindu ecology and Hindu economy go together. And the Hindu ecology and Hindu economy also includes the gift economy. So Vinoba Bhave, as Johnny mentioned, was my teacher. And I worked with him, I walked with him, and I learned from him many, many things. And he, his wonderful book, uh, Talks on the Gita, is a wonderful book. If you have not come across Vinoba Bhave's book uh, on the Gita, Talks on the Gita, it's worth reading. So I read that and I walked with Vinoba. And Vinoba said, our economy is a gift economy. Hindu economy is a gift economy. So he went from village to village asking big landlords to share their land as a gift to the poor. And he said, I love landlords. I love every human being. I have no discrimination. He will never criticize anyone. He will never complain about anyone. He will just inspire people and touch their hearts and touch their feelings and touch their generosity. So he persuaded thousands of landlords to give land to the poor, to the landless. And he collected 4 million acres of land. It's a miracle. That's a miracle of Hindu ecology and Hindu economy that landlords can give land and not one or two acres or five acres or 10 acres or 100 acres, but millions of acres, 4 million acres of land was given to Vinoba by the landlords, which Vinoba distributed among the poor who had no land. Because Vinoba said that people, poor people don't need money. We don't want to give them money. Many, many people said that we'll give you money. He said, no, no, I don't want your money. I want land so that people can have livelihood for forever. Money you have given today, they spend it, then tomorrow they are hungry again. But they have land every day, every season, every year, year after year, they can grow their food, their grain, their wheat and rice and papaya and onion and garlic and, uh, and oranges and mangoes and all the food and the, and, and the, and the uh, cotton for making clothes and, um, and the soil to build houses. Everything can come from the land. The Hindu economy and Hindu ecology is very much rooted in the soil. If there's no soil, there's no life. And so, um, so and a love of the soil. Soil and love go together. Uh, love and nature go together. We have to cultivate love of nature. <coughs> Our modern ecology and modern economy and industrial economy is very utilitarian. Uh, um, we value nature only in terms of nature's usefulness to humans. And we value nature in terms of money. This tree, $500, that, um, um, uh, that uh, animal, $200, whatever, we pr put price on uh, nature. This is where I think um, uh, we go further. And, and so deep ecology, which um, uh, Arne S from Norway, he went to India and he studied Mahatma Gandhi's, uh, Mahatma Gandhi's work and he studied Hindu ecology. And he came up with the idea of deep ecology. The Hindus have this belief that all living beings have intrinsic value. The value of nature is not to be measured in terms of nature's usefulness to humans, but nature has intrinsic value. Like you don't value uh, or put a value, monetary value or a human being 
on a human life. You don't say that Satish Kumar, you are worth uh, $5 million or $10 million. You don't put a value on human life. In the same way, we cannot put any monetary value and only judge the value of nature in terms of how useful it is for human use. So, um, so intrinsic value of nature, that is Hindu ecology, which has influenced um, uh, deep ecology movement and Mani Nash. Uh, so I would say the new story, the new science, the new way of thinking of James Lovelock, Arnie Ness, and, and many other people in the United States have embraced this idea of holistic thinking. For example, Wendell Berry, he is a holistic thinker, even though he may not know that what he's saying is rooted in Hindu ecology, but what he's saying and his poetry and his novels and his essays about land, about community is very deeply and very profoundly uh, 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 similar to Hindu ecology. And there are many others. Um, and the, the many American writers have influenced uh, Indians and India has influenced American writers like um, uh, Emerson and like, um, uh, like um, uh, um, uh, many, many others, Walt Whitman and, um, uh, and, uh, and Ruskin in, Eng in England. Um, uh, who, who was uh, Johnny who wrote the Walden Pond? Thoreau. Thoreau, yes, Thoreau. So Thoreau was influenced by Indian philosophy and then India was influenced by Thoreau and Mahatma Gandhi took back uh, the civil disobedience idea from Thoreau. So there had been a lot of uh, interchange between the Western countries like the United States of America and Europe and, and India. So now in uh, the United States, you have many, many great uh, thinkers and writers um, uh, like Fritjof Capra, for example, he had written his Tao of Physics. Uh, he wrote that in India. He was sitting uh, by the Ganges, uh, River Ganges in Varanasi, and he came up with the idea of Tao of Physics. Uh, and, and he put the dancing Shiva picture of the dancing Shiva on the cover of his Tao of Physics book. And so Fritjof Capra is another great example of, um, and then there are many others in, in California, there is a um, Californian Institute of Integral Studies that was very much influenced by Indian philosophy of Sri Aurobindo. So I'm giving you these examples to show you that uh, the Hindu ecology and ecological movement, even if it is no name and uh, no label, doesn't matter. We are not interested in labels. We are interested in the true substance that has influenced many, many other countries. So now we are all writing this new story and a new science and a new philosophy, which is holistic, which is uh, dependent on or rooted in uh, interconnectedness, interdependence, holistic thinking. And this is where uh, Schumacher College uh, comes in. And as uh, Johnny in introducing me said about Schumacher College, Schumacher College is very much practicing this new story and new science, which is, which is all coming together. Uh, we don't, I mean, we put labels um, uh, of Hindu ecology or whatever, deep ecology, Gaia, but we go beyond labels. And at Schumacher College, we bring all this confluence of many uh, new thinking, including interfaith thinking. There's a lot of good new thinking going on in the Christian church, particularly this uh, latest Pope, um, Pope Francis um, has a new book called Let Us Dream. And that book is full of this holistic, ecological, um, uh, egalitarian, um, uh, reverential ecology and deep ecology and a spiritual ecology. And so spiritual ecology is Hindu ecology. Reverential ecology is Hindu ecology. So Hindu ecology and reverential ecology go together. And so now many, many faiths are embracing the idea of ecology and how we live on planet Earth in a harmonious way so that our economy is not only about uh, five years or 10 years or 20 years or 100 years. Our economy has to continue to survive for millions of years to come. Therefore, this linear economy, linear economy, which means you take from nature, transform it into consumer goods, use it or not use it, abuse it, then throw it away on the landfill. That's a linear economy. 
And that's the economy of the modern times. Whereas the Hindu economy and Hindu ecology would say the nature is circular. The economy of nature is circular economy and circular ecology. So we have to embrace this principle of circularity and a cyclicality. And so whatever comes from nature must go back to nature. This is circular economy. Nothing is wasted, nothing is polluted. You take from nature, like when tree grows in the spring, we get leaves and then we get blossom. Then we get beautiful fruit, delicious fruit. Then in the autumn, the leaves fall, the fruit fall. What is not eaten goes back to the soil. The soil nourishes the roots. The roots uh, take the sap in the trunk and it nourishes and it nurtured and it's fed and it's um, uh, flourishing and then comes back in the spring and then leaves again and it blossoms again and the fruit again. This is a beautiful economy of nature. So Hindu economy and Hindu ecology is economy and ecology of nature. Nature is our true teacher. This is why all our Hindu philosophers and rishis always lived in the forest. Valmiki, who wrote Ramayana, he lived in the forest. Vyasa, who wrote Mahabharata, he lived in the forest. When, um, um, when uh, um, uh, Krishna uh, went to study, he went to the forest to learn about life and about, uh, about uh, philosophy. And so a Hindu culture is a forest culture. We, we living in the forest and learning from the forest, learning from the uh, natural world. So nature is our teacher. And, and my mother always used to tell me uh, that nature is our teacher. And he will say, why did the Buddha was enlightened, got enlightenment? He got enlightenment because he was sitting under a tree. Nowadays, we got, don't get enlightenment because we don't sit under a tree. We sit under a new light or in electric light, or we sit in front of a computer rather than sitting under a tree. And so if you sit under a tree and meditate on the tree and see how everything is interconnected and how the sun feeds this, this tree and how the soil feeds the tree and how rain feeds the tree and how tree um, feeds the people and how tree gives uh, uh, branches for, for the nesting of the birds and how um, uh, Everything, all life is interconnected. That is the example of trees. So Buddha learned from the tree. When um, uh, his son Rahula asked the Buddha, who is your teacher? Buddha said, my teacher is the soil. He touched the earth. He's called Bhumi Sparsha Mudra. Bhumi means earth. Sparsh means touching. Mudra means posture or gesture. So Bhumi Sparsha Mudra touching the earth and saying, earth is my teacher. I learn forgiveness from the earth. I learn um, generosity from the earth. I love, uncon I, I learn unconditional love from the earth. That is uh, the Indian uh, ecology. So Hindu ecology, Buddhist ecology, holistic ecology, and Hindu economy, they are all connected words. And so I have, I've rambled a bit around here and there everywhere, but I hope that you get the message that this holistic, reverential, um, uh, and, and a spiritual attitude to nature. We have to change our attitude to nature. Not see nature only a resource for the economy, but see nature as a source of life itself. The moment we change our attitude and not see nature down there and human beings above, higher up, and nature uh, is in the service of humanity and humanity higher up this hierarchy if we can forget that and we say we are equal to nature we are one with nature we are nature there is no separation the unity of life the moment we realize that we are in the realm of true hindu ecology thank you very much uh, the part of uh, the nature's intelligence could also be really to find the continual equilibrium, if not continuous equilibrium. So will that justify the onset of, you know, the volcanoes or earthquakes or in the current day and age, Corona kind of thing. And that is also part of the intelligence of nature or all that oneness that really finds the equilibrium whenever we deviate from our path. 
And therefore, yeah. the question would be, even though the human beings have, you know, excursions on the other part of oneness, which is nature, we call it, uh, do we have to worry about it for the long term? Because we will continually, if not continuously, find that equilibrium or the balance in that oneness itself, within itself. Yes, uh, very good question. I would say yes, to some extent, yes. Uh, in nature, there is a Brahma, which is origin, and then there's a Vishnu continuation, then the Shiva, which is a kind of uh, dissolution or ending. Uh, so beginning, continuing and ending. This is the process of life. And that's the Hindu philosophy and Hindu ecology. However, <coughs> there are two kinds of dissolution. <coughs> One dissolution is how nature creates in its own cycle. Like you said, volcano, or, or you can say natural death, we all die uh, and, and, and so on. So that is absolutely natural and that's a Shiva principle. But then humans out of their greed or out of their ignorance, they can create unnecessary destruction. And that is violence. That's not non-violence. That is not natural destruction. So I would say um, at this moment we are facing this coronavirus COVID-19, I cannot accept and I cannot, I do not feel that this is a natural um, calamity. I think this is more or less a man-made or human-made calamity because humans in industrial civilization have been encroaching over and over and over, more and more, destroying the natural habitat and natural life and getting into this monoculture of agriculture and destroying the rainforest and destroying all the kind of wild habitat and, and creating mass production of um, uh, uh, monocrops of soya or factory farms, thousands of animals in one factory farm. So the way we have organized our industrial economy and production system and agriculture, that all has um, affected um, the coronavirus. And therefore, I would say coronavirus is not a natural disaster. It's a result of the violence of uh, industrial system on nature. In the same way, the climate change, I would say, is not a natural disaster. Climate change is happening because of human activities. We have been putting fossil fuel in the environment, taking oil, which is Ma, ma, uh, thousands and thousands of feet down under the soil. We dig it, we bring it out, and we burn it in a, such a massive scale that the, uh, the uh, climate change is happening. So there is a difference between a natural system bringing some earthquake or some volcanoes or some tsunami or some other natural disasters. That is, of course, part of uh, birth, life, and death. That's natural. We die. I will die. But if we go to war, to Iraq or Iran or Afghanistan or Vietnam or First World War or Second World War, and we try to invade other countries and kill many, many thousands of people, that is not natural. That is a, a violence to other humans. In the same way, we have a violence to nature. So we have to make peace with nature. At the moment, we are almost like at war with nature. And the way we are treating our animals is a war act. The way we are treating our soil and our rainforest is a war act. And therefore, uh, this violence to nature is not natural. That is a human. So unless we practice non-violence in our life, unless we practice sanyam and restraint in our lives, and, and then accept whatever natural disaster comes, we be part of that. Like um, in nature, in uh, seasons, we get spring, then we get summer, then we get autumn, then there's a winter, and in winter we have a snow, and in winter we have no leaves on the trees, and in the winter we have many, um, uh, many hardship. That's part of natural thing. But if we create artificially because of our violence to nature, then that is different. So I would make a bit of differentiation there and use your wisdom to make that differentiation. But in principle, I agree with you that nature has its own course of creation, continuation, and dissolution. This is the nature's way, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. That is the idea of Hindu ecology. 
Well, let me ask a question. Uh, uh, Johnny introduced you and uh, uh, he told us that uh, you went from India to Moscow and so on. Uh, I wonder how long did it take and, and, and you were without money. I mean, when I walk out of my house without my wallet, uh, I don't expect to eat the next meal. How did you manage all that? <laughs> That's a very good question. Uh, you know, uh, I went, first of all, when I was thinking to go to protest against the nuclear weapons to Moscow, Paris, London, Washington, these were the four nuclear capitals. I thought, how should I go and protest against the weapons? If I go by plane, that's too easy. So let me walk. That will make a little more dramatic impact. Then I said, but even if I go with lots of money, I buy my food and I stay in bed and breakfast or in a guest house or in a hotel, um, that's, that's a kind of not much. So I have to do something a little more uh, dramatic to, to make a, a kind of statement about trust because wars begin in fear and peace comes out of trust. So unless I demonstrate trust, unless I practice trust, I, I be trust, there's no talk, peace, uh, uh, no good talking about peace and nonviolence and trust and love. I have to practice it. I have to show by example, as Mahatma Gandhi used to say, be the change that you want to see in the world. So I said, I will go without money. That will show that I trust humanity. And so I went out of India and then I was vegetarian. So uh, that was also difficult. So walking without money and vegetarian. These were the three things which made the journey a bit more difficult, but more enjoyable and more challenging, but more, uh, more uh, interesting. And so um, I went out of India and, um, and I said to myself and to my friend that if we go as Indians, we beat Pakistanis or Russians or Americans. If we go as Hindus, even a Hindu, you beat a Muslim. You meet a Christian. Even if we go as a Gandhian, we meet a communist or a capitalist or a socialist or some other philosophy. So it creates a dualism. But if we go as a human being, we meet human beings. No dualism, no separation. We are all human beings. And so we will depend on the hospitality of the strangers. And so we create a leaflet. And in the leaflet, I, mean, I was with my friend, two of us walked. So my friend was E.P. Menon, uh, from Kerala and myself from Rajasthan. And so we create a leaflet and we explain our journey. We are walking to Moscow, Paris, London, Washington. We are protesting against the nuclear weapons. We are not going just Moscow, Paris, London, Washington. We want to go to every village. We want to go to every home. We want to go to every church and mosque. We want to go to every school and university, whichever comes on our way. And we want to reach people and we want to spread the message of the, to the people and not only the governments and the Kremlin and the White House. Although we did go to Kremlin and we did go to White House and we did deliver a message there too. But that was not the only thing because the real superpower is the power of people. And the superpower of Russia or America or China or France or England is only a secondary superpower. The true superpower is superpower of people's opinion and people's power. And so we create this leaflet and we'll give this leaflet to people and they will read it and they will then ask us, why are you working? Why are you not having money? Then we explain to them. So this way we communicated with people, we learned languages or we found some interpreters. We did everything in order to make that happen. And so for two and a half years, not a single dollar, not a single cent in our pocket. And we survived, not only survived, but we were in the Kremlin, we were in the White House, we met Bertrand Russell, we met Martin Luther King, uh, we met um, uh, Pearl Buck, we met uh, John Byers, we met many, many wonderful people. And they were all embraced us. And it was reported in the New York Times, in the Washington Post, in the Guardian, in Moscow um, Radio and Moscow Television and in Paris and everywhere. So publicity, we went to universities, we went to schools, we went to churches, we went to mosques, uh, we went to people's homes. So everywhere we tried to reach the message. So that was our mission. And surprisingly, but amazingly, 
um, we were looked after by the strangers and the, and the hospitality of the strangers and the ordinary people was amazing. I can say that if you have a trust in your heart and you make a resolution that you will walk without money for the cause of peace and nonviolence and making peace within your heart and making peace. And we are not against anybody. We are protesting against the bomb, but we are not against Russia. We are not against America. We are not against any people. We are only against the bomb, against the war weapons and war preparation. We are not against people. All people are good. Russians are good. Americans are good. Black people are good. White people are good. Men are good. Women are good. Poor people are good. Rich people are good. Everybody is good. We are not criticizing anybody. We are criticizing the system which creates war and, and pollution and waste and nuclear weapons and armaments and destruction of our nature. So this way, our heart was full of love. Our heart was full of trust. And, and we, leaf, we gave leaflet to people and we explained to people and we were received by people everywhere. So there was a no problem. Dr. Kumar, I was wondering if you can say something about the significance of the cow in Hinduism. Significance of cow. First of all, significance of cow begins with the significance of being vegetarian. So uh, no animals to be killed. In India, we have sacred birds as well, and sacred uh, elephant is also very sacred. Every temple will have an elephant in front of the temple. And, 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 and many other animals, like swan is a very sacred bird and prohibited from killing. And the peacock is a sacred bird in Rajasthan. So we have many other animals because compassion to animals and animals and humans are same. So all our gods and goddesses have animal companion. So Shiva has a mouse. Never mind cow. Uh, mouse is sacred. We have a temple for the mouse. Um, they just, we have a temple for the snakes. In Rajasthan, if you go, uh, in my home uh, uh, state, we have a temple for the snakes and we worship the snake and we give milk to the snake. And then we, worship, we uh, consider all living creatures sacred. Now cow is special. Because as vegetarians, uh, you have one pet animal. And so instead of having a dog or a cat, you have cow. Because cow is not only a, a companion, but also uh, you can get some protein as a vegetarian, you can have some milk. But no cow should be killed. Even when the cow becomes old, stops giving milk, still you maintain that cow in a cow, a old age cow home. Like you have old age people's home. We in India have old age cows home called Goshala. And so cows are always maintained and never killed, even when they are old and even when they stop giving milk. In the same way, the bullock, we never kill the bullock. Bullock is used to plow the land, but otherwise when they get old, they also are kept in a old age cow house or old age bullock house. So cows are, cows are part of our agricultural system so that we get manure from the cows and the bullocks. And manure is very important to build the soil because soil is everything in Hindu philosophy, and Hindu ecology, soil is the mother. And so if you don't build the soil, you cannot do anything. So if you look after the soil, soil will look after everything else. All food comes from the soil, clothes come from the soil, um, trees come from the soil, wood comes from the soil. Soil is a sacred. And so how do you build the soil? So your cow dung, you build the soil. You put the compost on the soil and a cow dung builds the soil. And therefore cow and the agriculture and the soil went together. And also it's a house cow. There's no factory farm. There are no cows. Cows go out in the open. They uh, graze openly, uh, they are free range, they are uh, grass fed, uh, there's no, um, uh, no um, uh, any kind of confinement for the cows. They live freely and completely freely and in the forest. And then in the evening, they know their way home. They come by them, my mother had two cows. So I was grown up with the sacred cows. And so they come home in the evening and we look after them, we give them a little bath, we give them nice place, and we look after them and then we take milk. We are always saying, take only a little milk. 
don't take whole milk take a half of the milk and then leave the rest of the milk for the uh, calf to drink so the calf is fed and humans are also fed so this kind of little milk from the cow but looking after the cow and and the cow dung is not only used for the building of the soil but also cow dung is good uh, for the floor cow dung is good for the walls of the of the huts and so we use cow dung as a kind of like a soil and therefore cow has a very great economic hindu economy and sacred economy and a spiritual economy and a caring economy is a part of the system so that was created over hundreds of years of indian culture and the cow um, and mahatma gandhi also um, protected the cow and created cow culture and vinoba also created cow culture so there is hindu tradition hindu philosophy hindu culture hindu ecology hindu religion hindu economy they are all compatible with the cow so we consider cow as a sacred but people think that in india only cow is sacred but this is not true um, all animals are sacred and we are vegetarians so we never kill any animal and um, and uh, all gods and goddesses have an animal associate and um, and um, uh, mahavira who is a jain prophet had a lion as associate and then as i said shiva had an associate uh, krishna is the cow herd and so krishna and cow go together and so he looked up the cows and he um, took the cows to graze so god himself krishna himself takes the cows to graze and he plays the flute to please the cows so the cows can enjoy the music why did he play the flute to the cows because the cows enjoy the music people think the cows don't know the music this is not true in indian tradition we say cows know the music and cows uh, enjoy the music actually in russia they have even scientifically proved that even plants enjoy the music and so krishna himself god krishna lord krishna looked after the cows so there is old old indian tradition of taking care of animals and humans humans and animals are companions of each other and we must always uh, take care of them and when uh, in mahabharata there is a story that um, um, uh, um, yudhishthira the the the, the uh, noble king when he was uh, he he died he went to heaven uh, in the paradise heaven and he went with his dog and the the gatekeeper at the heaven said that you are welcome you are a religious man you have the place in heaven but why this dog should come in the heaven what has this dog achieved done nothing so it cannot come so the heaven gatekeeper refused to have dog in the heaven and yudhishthira said sorry if you cannot take dog in the heaven i am not coming so he wanted to return back so he the heaven had to make an exception and allow yudhishthira to come in the heaven with the dog it's a kind of metaphorical story it's a kind of uh, allegory or a kind of um, example to show that in indian culture all animals are sacred cows are special because of the agriculture and because the cow dung builds the soil and also we take a bit of milk from the cow to have a protein and so it's a good relationship and we never kill cow but actually speaking in india all animals are sacred and all life is sacred and we are practicing non violence to all living beings and that is the reason the cow is also sacred but swan is sacred lion is sacred mouse is sacred serpent is sacred and uh, all animals are sacred thank you you are welcome i have one question yes uh, hinduism has lot to offer but then there are forces of conversion and uh, also we call it like secularism and hindu phobia working in india which are trying to destroy the hinduism and proving it to be you know old and uh, wrong uh, non violence uh, is what we learn but non violence leaves us at the mercy of the violent enemy who wants your land and resources and wants to destroy you so these teaching of hinduism which do not resist uh, the enemies become the means of destruction of hinduism so how do we deal with them we deal with non violence mahatma gandhi was the greatest hindu um, in our time and he showed us the way that non violence does not mean cowardice 
Nonviolence does not mean um, surrender to injustice. Nonviolence does not mean acceptance of injustice. Nonviolence is to um, use nonviolence as a way of resistance. And so uh, India was suffering. Um, in, there was no nonviolence uh, when you accept the colonialism or imperialism or discrimination of any kind and exploitation of any kind. That is not uh, nonviolence. And so nonviolence is a very active way. Uh, so you resist, you uh, non cooperate with any violent being. And, and so, um, so uh, nonviolence is a very powerful. Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King in the United States show the example. I was fortunate to meet Martin Luther King. And he said to me that I learned nonviolence from Mahatma Gandhi and from India because. He said, for, for Mahatma Gandhi, nonviolence is not only a weapon to protest, but also a way of life. And therefore, um, Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King, these are the two great examples to show us that nonviolence is a weapon of the brave and courageous and powerful and not a weapon of the weak and the, and the timid and, and somebody who, who can surrender. So use nonviolence as a strong, um, uh, strong, strong methodology a strong way to uphold your values and your dignity and your uh, your freedom and your your uh, your um, principles and philosophy and so nonviolence is not a way of the weak um, and, and 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 forgiveness is not the way of the weak kshama veera se bhushanam ahinsa paramo dharma but we indian we ourselves we have forgotten the idea of nonviolence and we have equated nonviolence with non-action, cowardice, surrender, acceptance um, of injustice, uh, acceptance of uh, everything. And so that is not nonviolence. So we Hindus don't practice our Hinduism. And we don't, uh, Mahatma Gandhi did practice, Vinoba Bhave practiced, I, um, uh, Vivekananda practiced, and Ramana Maharshi practiced, Aurobindo practiced. Um, many, many wonderful people practice, but generally speaking, we have to practice nonviolence in a powerful way. So nonviolence is not uh, to surrender to injustice and 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 a cowardice and running away from uh, the uh, running away from the um, from the uh, situation in which you are exploited. No, no, nonviolence is a very wonderful, powerful uh, principle of ahimsa paramo dharma. It's not an easy thing. You have to understand what is nonviolence. Many people don't understand what is nonviolence. Nonviolence is a positive way of loving people and showing the power of love. Power of love is greater than power of nuclear weapons. Uh, power of love and power of nonviolence is greater than uh, power of the White House or the Kremlin or or the uh, or the any government or any any uh, military or any police. Uh, power of the of of um, Jesus Christ of love and the Buddha of compassion and Mahatma Gandhi of nonviolence and Shankaracharya and and Vivekananda. All these are the examples of powerful use of nonviolence. No, no, nonviolence is not surrendering. Nonviolence is not cowardice. Nonviolence is not acceptance of exploitation or colonialism or imperialism or conversion or anything like that. Nonviolence is a way of the awake and, and, and enlightened and, and courageous and a brave and, uh, and um, somebody who can live up to nonviolence is a very difficult way. And so, so, so you have to understand what is true nonviolence and not just saying nonviolence means not fighting. That's not nonviolence. Nonviolence is a positive way of living a good life and upholding your principles. I hope you understand what true nonviolence is. Um, if I may, uh, I'd like to share a little story about how I came to know you. Uh, Thank you. Okay. It's, uh, <laughs> it happened many years ago on my way to Mumbai, Bombay then, uh, from US, in Amsterdam airport. I was walking around waiting for my flight. And in the bookstore, I found a magazine called Resurgence. And that was my in introduction to you. And in the plane, yes. I read an article that you had written about your trip walking in UK, going around the borders of UK, uh, visiting different nooks and crannies and 
cathedrals and so on. Uh, and it occurred to me that, geez, uh, on my way back, I should change my air ticket and go via London rather than Amsterdam and maybe drop by and visit you. I was so inspired by your expressions. And then I learned about the Schumacher College. And it has always been in my head that someday when I'm in London, I'm going to see if I can meet uh, Satish Kumar and if I can learn a little more about it. Well, mine is a happy day. I didn't have to go to London, right? Sitting at home, I've met you now and I'm very <laughs> happy and thank you very much. This is very profound and it's a personally very exciting thing for me. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for sharing your story. That's a very, I'm touched and moved and delighted to hear that story that uh, one article and one magazine has um, uh, has a kind of touched you and, and inspired you. That's a very kind story, very lovely story. And uh, yes, I walked around Britain as well. It, when I was 50 years old, in India, you know, 50 years is the age when you go Vana Prastha. The Vana Prastha means going in the forest. The forest is a metaphor. It's a forest of the mind, going in the wild of the mind. And, and, and um, psychologically uh, withdrawing from the worldliness and going in the forest. This is why uh, Indian culture is called forest culture, Vana Sanskriti. And so Vana Prastha is going in the forest. So I said, now I'm 50, what should I do? How do I practice this Vana Prastha? So I said to my family that I'm going to go and just walk in the wild and natural world of trees and rivers and oceans and of hills and mountains of Great Britain. So I walked from my home in Devon, which is in the Southwest, and I walked to Canterbury and then along the East Coast of uh, Great Britain. Uh, I walked from um, Lincoln, York, Durham, Lindisfarne, Edinburgh, um, and then Iona, and then walked back on the West Coast and then through Wales and so on. So that was four months journey. And again, I did it without any money like I did from India to America, I did it without money in England. And even then I was received by people, generosity and of strangers and hospitality of ordinary people. It was a wonderful journey. And that journey I wrote in Resurgence regularly, every issue, for few issues I wrote about the journey. And then now that journey and, and that whole thing has become part of my book, uh, autobiography called No Destination. And so that includes the journey from India to America, but also journey around Britain and, and how I became editor of Resurgence and how I became uh, founder of Schumacher College. All those stories are in my autobiography called No Destination. So thank you, Shari, for your, your story. Yeah, namaste. Uh, namaste. This is the most profound and uh, the best present you know, talk uh, I've ever heard on ecology. I'm somewhat in this field but uh, it's so inspiring to hear what you said. And what I, I was going to ask you a question, but I don't have a question. I just have a comment. So yes, you, please, please, please share your comment. Yeah, so it's very brief. Uh, I think you not only talked about philosophy, but uh, you also showed us a way to implement what uh, your teachings. You know, we on our own way, following our own dharma, uh, we can do something rather than not doing anything. So it's uh, for me, uh, it's very inspiring. And, uh, you know, so I have learned so much uh, from your presentation, your uh, speech here that I think I will implement that in my own life. I don't have, I don't know how many years I have left. I'm 74 years old, but uh, I will, you know, whatever I can do. And that goes for everybody, right? Each one of us has our dharma and nobody is to tell us what our dharma is, we have to find out ourselves. So I have to find out what my dharma is and uh, then uh, translate your teachings into practice because that's finally what matters. So thank you so much for your- Yeah, well, that's a lovely comment. As um, Mahatma Gandhi said, be the change that you want to see in the world. Everything begins with ourselves. Uh, we are, in a way, kind of microcosm of macrocosm. That we are in a miniature 
the world, the universe. So if we begin with ourselves and radiate love and compassion and nonviolence and kindness and ecology and, and a good living, and uh, if, we, if we radiate that, then like a radiator warms the room, we radiate our, uh, our, and warm our family and our village and our street and our community and our workplace and our country. So uh, being the example and practicing is, is all about. It's, uh, ideas are there only to point out uh, the practice. The real is the practice. And the ideas and discussions are only as a pointing to reminding ourselves. Like um, when you have a, a candle to light, um, so you have matches. So matches is useful, but that match is useful only to light the candle. But it's the candle which has to burn and continuously burn for hours. So the light is in the candle and burning is the candle and the candle has to burn. So in the same way, this kind of talk is like a matches. You just light the uh, idea or some kind of reminder, uh, some, kind of, uh, some kind of indicator uh, to remind people what you already know. What I'm speaking is not something uh, that you don't know. Uh, everybody, all of you know in your heart about uh, ecology, about nonviolence, about all these principles, but I'm only here to remind that like a matches uh, lighting a candle and then you have to practice you have to be it uh, you have to live it uh, in your own life from your own consciousness not follow me but live your own truth because every one of us have our own swadharma bhagavad gita talks about swadharma we have our own light we have our own truth we have our own consciousness we have our own divine uh, spirit and divine being within us so live your own truth Practice your own values and ideal. Uh, and that's all it is. I'm here only as a reminder. So thank you very much for your lovely comment. Uh, this is Arvind Naik. Uh, can I also ask a quick question? Please. Uh, Dr. Satish Kumar, uh, you are inf infusing us with inspiring energy. And thank you so much for your talk. I had a quick perspective question. Uh, so obviously, many times when we talk about nature and ecology, we say we have to go back to nature. And we use this perspective to say that we used to be in nature now with all the modern technology and science and growth that we have gone away from nature. Uh, in my view, nature is the highest science. It is actually the most advanced technology and it is the, it's, it, uh, it is the most sophisticated and advanced and uh, it's almost divine, right? Because it is how it created human being and all the animals and all the life so when we go towards nature and when we try to be in harmony with nature, aren't we actually advancing our science and technology? Isn't that more uh, uh, making forward in the science and technology? And therefore, if we put that perspective, people won't feel so bad about uh, knowing nature and, and being in harmony with nature. So having that perspective as a young engineer, scientist, or even to upcoming people that we're not actually going backward, we're going forward with a harmony with nature. So what are your thoughts on that perspective? Thank I you. totally agree with you uh, that uh, going, uh, understanding nature, embracing nature is going forward, not going backward, not going back to nature, but going back, uh, forward uh, nature. And uh, science and technology is very good. Science is very important. Science and spirituality go together. Without science, spirituality can become a dogma. Without science, spirituality can become fundamentalism. Without science, spirituality can become very narrow-mindedness. Therefore, scientific thinking uh, creates a search for truth, an open mind, and inquiring for truth. So that science is very fundamentally important um, for spirituality. So spirituality and science are complementary to each other. They are friends of each other. They are not enemies of each other. And so science and technology. Only question is, what is the purpose of science and technology? And what is the purpose of religion? If the purpose of religion is to um, convert people to follow you, uh, so your ego and your institution and your church and your um, uh, kind of uh, organization becomes rich and powerful and you dominate people, then religion is corrupt. Uh, 
In the same way, if science, purpose of science is to make more profit, more money, more power to people uh, and, and, and um, uh, dominating nature and polluting nature, then science and technology also become corrupt, like religion can become corrupt. So if you follow religion for the uh, development of the soul, the spirit, the consciousness, the imagination, uh, the inner, inner um, uh, calm and a peace, and a, and a kind of calm abiding and peaceful living. If that is the purpose of religion, then everybody follow that in your heart and then religion is a good thing. And then in the same way, science, you search for spirit, you search for truth, and you find new ways of doing things, new ways of living, new ways of being, that is a good thing. But if you use science and technology to create nuclear weapons, that's a misuse of science, like religion can become uh, dogmatic, science can become dogmatic. So using science to create nuclear weapons or genetic engineering or uh, pollution of the air or pollution of the rivers or overfishing or factory farming, then it's a misuse of science. So it's not the fault of science, it's a fault of human uh, greed and human uh, uh, selfishness that we want to put animals in factory farms and exploit them and, and, and waste that meat just to make money. So it's not the problem with science and technology. It's a problem with human consciousness. And human consciousness can corrupt religion. It can corrupt um, politics. It can corrupt science. It can corrupt anything. So what I'm talking about, uh, Hindu ecology and nonviolence, is to have the the purity of consciousness and a purity of mind so that when we approach nature, we approach our religion, we approach science, we approach technology, we approach money with a good intention. Intention is all. You can practice politics with good intention or you can practice politics with bad intention. Bad intention makes politics bad. Good intention makes uh, politics good. A good intention can make science good, religion good, Politics good, economics good, business good. Business is important. You need business because we need food, we need clothes, we need houses, we need shoes, we need mm, uh, computers, we need telephones, we need railways, we need everything. And so those things can be provided for the good of people. Um, business is good, but if your intention is just to make money and become billionaire and exploit people and, and your glory and your ego and, and so on, then business can become bad. So it's not the problem of science, technology, business, politics, or religion. It's the intention. What is your intention? So what Hindu philosophy and Hindu ecology I'm talking about is very much based on this idea of consciousness, idea of intention, idea of motivation. If we can have pure intention, then everything we touch will be good. If we have bad intention, then even if you speak truth but bad intention, the truth can be dangerous. Even non-violence, you can be cunningly using non-violence with bad <coughs> intention. Non-violence becomes violence. And so we have to address the idea of in um, uh, intention and motivation and an attitude to nature, attitude to people, an attitude to money, an attitude to politics. This is the most important thing. So there's nothing wrong with science and technology. It's the wrong with our intention. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. I could never explain better. So appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. You know, as you know, the young people are so much concerned about the future of the planet with the climate change and so on. Uh, oftentimes I've felt is that their passion, uh, which is very refreshing, uh, doesn't really make the impact. And to some extent, that might be because uh, that passion is not directed in, in a wise way. And to me, you are a symbol of that wisdom. Question I have is, do you have interactions with the young people who are trying to move the earth and change the business of the planet by, you know, engaging them in caring for the planet, in, in sharing in the awareness of the future? And, and how do you interact with them? And, and if you don't, uh, or, or maybe what you do these days, I'm just very curious about, you know, how you spend your day, for example, 
in terms yeah. of no we we uh, we i am in touch with young people and uh, and uh, and at the schumacher college we get lots of young people i even started a school in my village called the small school in okay. heartland and and that and uh, that we train young people and i am hopeful with young people like the swedish girl uh, greta thunberg yeah. she is one of the example of young people taking the cause of ecology and also uh, the uh, on inaugura- inauguration of um, uh, president biden uh, the young um, black um, poet wonderful yes. inspiring poetry um, amanda gorman now 22 year old what a spirit and what a kind of high value she represented and that influenced many people around the world and and uh, many people were in tears when listening to her poetry and and uh, many people are uh, feeling so there are young people like those are the two good examples because they are famous but there are many many hundreds of young people in england in india they are marching on fridays and they are saying that we don't want this kind of economy we want an economy which is good for um, uh, environment good for people and so i am working with young people and at schumacher college we are running courses for young people and i go to schools and universities and i give talks to schools and go to um, talk to universities and talk to young people so i am in touch i am doing my best to inspire young people because they are our future they are our our hope um because they are going to lead the world at, of tomorrow and so yes you are absolutely right it's the young people are waking up and they are saying that this kind of education only education to get a career and make money and become successful is not good enough we want to be educated to do, look after our planet earth we want to be educated to look after our people and so people and planet should come first and not this personal glory and success and making money and becoming big professional and big career uh, seeking all that is not so good many many young people are saying that and this is very heartening so thank you for raising that question and i think young people are our hope first of all thank you for all the great talk and your knowledge and your inspiration to go around the world uh, regarding weapons and all the wrong things my question is like in us gun violence okay it's getting it's not getting better nobody wants to you know do the right thing just like when we buy a car we have to have a insurance first and we have to follow the rules so i was reading this morning that our elected officials want to make carrying a, you know gun more uh, you know kind of uh, easy you know so you you know we are non violent you know people and we are our, our culture our upbringing and all that this is a big concern you know i'm sure you know with your knowledge and experience there are little children killed in school they have to go through metal detectors and here our elected official you know carries a gun you know for in the congress you know what kind of example is that so this is a big concern and we are totally i think uh, a failure in united states to you know have our leaders they are elected uh, you know to tackle this this very big concern you know we 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 don't want to, we are not that kind of people like you said religion science our own you know actions all play a role together so what what uh, would you tell you know people like us who you know who are very anxious you know you you kind of when you go outside your home to buy grocery with this covid and all that you feel concerned you don't know who may be carrying a you know gun in their pocket yes well, i mean i i have experienced gun in the united states when i was walking and and after meeting martin luther king um in um jo- uh, in georgia uh, it was 1964 and uh, in 1964 uh, i went to a restaurant with a friend who took me to a restaurant and i was thrown out at a gun point and so i have experienced the gun violence um and i could have been killed but i was fortunate to 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 survive and so uh, i have experienced that and therefore i agree with you that we need to create a new consciousness a new movement like you have a movement for uh, black lives matter like you have movement for civil rights uh, like we have movement for climate change and we have movement for ecology and uh, organic agriculture and and a holistic food and whole food and uh, and natural medicine 
we need a new movement of the similar kind, um, which reduces uh, the, the dependence on gun and more promoting the principle of nonviolence and, and solving all our problems through talking, negotiation, uh, conversation, dialogue, and not by killing. I mean, in America, um, this gun violence, young people get killed in the schools and many other uh, incidents happen. They are very tragic. And so we need a new movement, a new movement. And maybe you can lead that movement. You can give your life uh, to create that movement. And so many, many people join you. And, and then you get new aware. once the awareness rises from the bottom up, then the government will change and government will legislate. But government will not legislate until and unless people are ready, consciousness is there, and public opinion is strong in favor of reducing uh, gun uh, use of gun and gun violence. So I think the most important thing is to build this people's consciousness and people's awareness that in the end, gun is not our safety. In the end, our true security is in friendship, in love, in respect for each other, respect for life. So those kind of ideas have to be promoted. That's a long journey. It's not going to happen overnight, but we have to start somewhere. Uh, a, a journey of thousand miles begin with first step. When I walked from India to America, uh, it was two and a half years. And I met somebody in, in the Khyber Pass, an American. And he was driving uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, um, Pakistan to America, or he was driving to Europe. And he stopped and he offered me a lift. And, and he said, do you want a lift? I said, no, I'm walking. He said, where are you walking to? I was standing in Khyber Pass in Pakistan. And this yeah, yeah, American... A Quaker from Philadelphia asking me this question, where are you walking to? I said, sir, I'm walking to the United States of America. And he said, what? Do you know where the United States of America is? I said, sir, I have never been there, but I, I believe that it exists. And I hope to get there on foot like Columbus discovered America by boat. I hope to discover America on foot. So he was very surprised. He gave me his card. So if you get to America, call me. I want to see that you have made it. And so, so that journey took step by step, day by day, one day at a time, one step at a time. And I made the 8,000 mile journey in the end. That is an example. The 1,000 miles journey starts with one step. So if you want to achieve the end of gun violence, start a small movement, 10 people, 20 people, 100 people, 1,000 people, 5,000 people, slowly, slowly grow and make a new consciousness, new awareness, people realizing that our true security is not in the gun, not in violence, but true security in friendship, dialogue, conversation, intelligent thinking, and compassion. So I would say we need to begin that movement and start small. Don't worry that overnight you want to change whole America. It cannot happen. When Martin Luther King started his journey, he could have never dreamt that one day a man like Obama, a black man, could be in the White House. And he could have never dreamt that Kamala Harris could become a vice president. So he started his journey. And slowly, slowly, over a long period, things are changing. Still long way to go. Still, there is a lot of uh, racial discrimination in the United States, but we have come a long way and we are more aware of it. So in the same way, the gun violence will come to an end only if we start that movement and go a long way. And so I will encourage you to do your best and get more people together and, and organize to create a new consciousness, a new awareness, and that could be successful. I just have a comment because I really appreciate this uh, talk. It's so good. Thank you, Dr. Satish. I, I see you are an icon in yourself. Can you, uh, and you are an older adult. So how do you see that the young and older adults, the, the very young who are teenagers, adolescents, they can be connected with the older adults and get the wisdom. So you could initiate and help. Uh, we want to do it. But if you throw some light on it through your college also and here, it could be a very good uh, work to work together. How do you see that? Yes, I think it's very important we connect with the young people. And the 
intergenerational communication, intergenerational. So old and young together, because there's some experience, some uh, knowledge, some, um, some um, uh, facilities are there with the older generation. The enthusiasm and energy and, and vision and idealism is there among the young generation. And so we need to connect two together. So we have to develop intergenerational um, a dialogue. And so in order to do that, uh, what you need to do is a regular, in every, in Minneapolis, if you are there or in Seattle or in, in wherever you are, create a small uh, gathering of young and old together once a month maybe. And you say those who are, inter and put it on your internet or put it on your website or put it wherever you, you have your communication um, and say to young people that if you are free on such and such Saturday, let's get together, um, have a potluck or have some kind of tea together and let us talk about the issues of nonviolence, issues of climate change, issues of ecology, issues of living well, issues of gun violence, anything you want to talk about. Intergenerational dialogue is very important. We just young people together, old people together, not enough. Young and old together, talking to each other and helping each other. That is the way forward. And so I would say, if you are, wherever you are in your town, in your neighborhood, create one Saturday a month. And when 10, 15, 20, don't worry about the numbers, 10, 15, 20, whatever number come, but it should be mixed group, a few old and a few young, and then have a dialogue and say to young people, how can we help you? And ask uh, young people how young people can help the old because we can learn from the young mm -hmm. as much as we can teach them. Uh, I, t I go to schools and I started a school here in, my village and I get young people in, in um, Schumacher College and I say to them that I am your teacher, but I'm also your student. I learn from young people. So I was so old people need to be humble and, and be prepared to listen to young people. And so if we can create a monthly meeting of older and younger people, intergenerational dialogue, that'll be a fantastic um, uh, move and fantastic step in the right direction. So I would advise you to create such initiative and every one of us can do something. Uh, every one of us can do something. The activism is not only reserved for Gandhi or Martin Luther King or Mother Teresa or Vandana Shiva. Uh, every one of us can be activists and uh, we are all activists. And so we can do something, uh, organize a small thing and see how it goes. Um, you sow a seed and the seed has um, capacity to become a tree. But if you don't sow the seed, you will never see the tree. And so in order to get a big movement, you have to sow the small seed um, in your backyard or in your um, neighborhood or in your community, wherever you are, start something small and see how it grows. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Satish Ji, uh, Hindu Temple of Minnesota, now they run on solar power. And that, that's a project they did in two, year, two years back. Action which they took uh, towards the ecological movement and yeah. if you have any other ideas, let us know so that we can implement it also. Okay, okay. But I think this idea of the, the wonderful lady who suggested um, intergenerational dialogue, if our Hindu temple can also help to create this intergenerational dialogue to get a few young people and few older people together and say how we can work together, that would be a very good initiative. But I will think more. And if I have any ideas, I will let you know. Yes. So thank you very much for inviting me and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak to you and meet you. And thank you, Johnny, uh, for your initiative and introducing me to the temple in, in um, uh, Minneapolis and, um, and, uh, and introducing me to all these wonderful audience there. I'm delighted to have this dialogue and, and wish you well. And if any other time next year or sometimes you want me again uh, to come and talk to you, I'm at your service. I'm at your disposal. Please always ask me. And thank you again uh, for listening to me and inviting me. I'm delighted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Satish. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, organizer.